pit with your hosts Kyle and Chris. What's happening, Chris? Hey, happy Tuesday. How's everybody doing out there? Hey, after my Cowboys played the way they played this weekend, I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> my Bengals are still the most consistent team in the NFL. So, I that... <laughs> oh, they screwed you up in one game, though. Yeah, we're still we're still gonna get the number one pick. We're still gonna get to ruin Joe Burrow's life. So. <laughs> well, we have our special guest Paul Bradford on. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you. So anyway, let's just get started, man. How's the how's the weather over there, man? We got like allergies real bad. I've been sniffling, sneezing for two weeks. Uh, it's cold. I mean, you know, it is cold. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I don't like uh, having to to, to uh, scrape my windscreen in the morning. Um, but yeah, it's it's cold and wet. <laughs> so <Yeah>. t- <laughs> I hear, yeah, I hear you. We hadn't got the wet yet, but man, it's been well. Last night it was down in the thirties. Too cold for me. Oh. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's uh, in the thirties. I think I think it's actually supposed to be hitting the twenties. I mean, it's supposed to be like a dry but really cold. Oh my goodness! So what country in? Uh, actually, in Ohio. In Ohio. What part of Ohio? I'm originally from Columbus. Sorry. I'm originally from Columbus. What part of Ohio? Uh, I'm actually just the uh, northwest. Uh, what town? Harrison. Okay. Yeah. Man, what is it? We've been nothing but people from Ohio. Well, not from Ohio. Well, living in Ohio. <laughs> it didn't say. Right now, it's 28 degrees right now. So. Yeah. Man, yeah. yeah. Cold as hell. Yeah. It didn't sound like an Ohio accent to me. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not. So. <laughs> Well, tell us a bit about yourself. Where were you born and raised and all that good stuff? Oh, I was born just outside of London um, in the UK. Um, spent most of my life there. Um, well, I say most of it. I mean, yeah, no, it was still most. I mean, I came to America about 13 years ago, um, 14 years No, about 13 years ago. And, um, yeah, I sort of stayed. Well, you, you come to Texas, we'll get rid of that accent for you. Well, I think a couple of times. Uh, that was hot as hell, so, you know, I don't want to do that again. Um, I spent 10 years in uh, Tucson, actually. Um, oh. I was in uh, Tucson, Arizona for about 10 years. Um, then I, I did a couple of years in Florida, and then uh, I'm, I'm now up in, in Ohio. Man, you must like the cold, then. I preferred it to the heart, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I know. And the cool thing about Ohio, okay. the, thing, the, the nice thing about where I am, I'm right on the tri-state. I mean, I'm, I'm on the border of Indiana and Kentucky. So I'm right there where, you know, you can actually get all four seasons in one day. <laughs> that sounds like Texas. Right? <laughs> so what got you into the, doing the paranormal? Well, I mean... I mean, well, I mean, I, I joined my first paranormal team when I was in Texas. Oh, sorry, when I was in Tucson. I wasn't in Texas. When I was in Tucson, um, because, I mean, I had an opportunity. Plus, you don't really want to do anything during the day out there. It's damn hot. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, you want to be doing stuff at night. Um, but I've always had an interest in the paranormal from, I mean, like I said, I mean, I you know, grew up in the UK. I mean, I was born in, in 79. And so five years old, Ghostbusters came out and, um, you know, it made quite an impact, really. I mean, I guess I just grew always wanted to be a Ghostbuster. Um, you know, I, I watched a lot of television, um, The X-Files, um, Doctor Who, Star Trek, things like that. Um, all things that sort of, I guess, use a lot of technology um, and, you know, future, you know, there's a lot of sort of, you know, concept stuff there. And um, from, from my point of view, I mean, I, I like building things and, um, you know, just sort of that, you know, my my, my gadget building uh, sort of evolved and, and, you know, started building stuff for paranormal um, groups. And uh, somehow I ended up on a TV show. That's pretty That's interesting. interesting. Have your investigations been in the States or have you been able to do anything back in the UK? 
Well, we did. So, I mean, so um, about 2009, so say 10 years ago, um, I received a call um, asking if I would be interested in being part of the TV show um, Ghost Hunters International, um, which was traveling the world looking for ghosts. That's, you know, um, and that was for Sci Fi Channel. And I did that for about four years. So I've, I investigated locations in the uh, in the UK, um, throughout Europe. I did a lot of South America, um, you know, Jamaica. Um, you know, um, uh, what else should we do? Um, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, um, American Samoa, New Zealand, Australia, um, Tasmania. Um, so literally, you, literally, yeah, literally yeah, the world. Yeah, I mean, we basically. You know, obviously you had Ghost Hunters, and then you had Ghost Hunters International. So Hunters investigated the U.S., Ghost Hunters International had a much bigger playground. I mean, we, we investigated everywhere else. So your new project coming up, tell us about that. So the new one actually starts this Friday, um, 11 o'clock um, on a Friday night, um, which is, uh, that's Eastern. So that's roughly, I think, about 8 o'clock um, over on the West Coast. Um and uh, it's a different style of show. Um, this one here basically uh, utilizes the tools of um, social media, uh, crowdsourcing. Um, you know, we use the thing is like so. Social media really has uh, how how do you even put it? It's basically integrated itself into our lives. We cannot yeah. get away from it. We cannot, you know, as much as you may want to, you know. Remove yourself completely from. Uh, is that Joe Chin behind you? It looks like a Joe Chin picture. Anyway, <laughs> I, like from, I, think I, should, I think I can't. It's a very. Anyway, sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a very different style of show. I think. Um, you know, it's not the cookie cut go something show. Yeah. Um, and it, it's like I say, it's sort of uh, based uh, around social media. I don't know if you're familiar with the dear David story from um, Adam Ellis is, is one another of the hosts his best friend Jen Lewis is also on the show and Adam Ellis um, a few years ago had this encounter this um, it, you know with this experience uh, in his apartment he, I guess he, he was living alone and weird things were happening um, and so what he then did is, is he actually used to work for BuzzFeed and he um, so he already had a bit of a following anyway um, but he documented what was going on, and he basically kept track, almost like a journal, on his Twitter. Um, and he hashtagged Dear David, because um, he uh, was under the impression, or he believed, that he was being haunted by a child. Now, someone who doesn't know what's going on, someone who's never uh, experienced paranormal activity, someone who, 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 who just doesn't understand, can be quite scared. You know, you don't know what's going on, and you're, you know, you're filming weird stuff, and you're you're taking pictures of weird things, and you know your animals are acting strangely. All this stuff was happening, and he's just typing away, you know, over a course of say two years. Um, and people followed this this entire story, um, and you know people were offering suggestions. And this, have you tried this? Did you do this? And so it gave it gives Adam like a, a different perspective from the point of view of somebody else who's also encountering um, the same sort of thing. So if someone is at home right now and they don't know what to do they're experiencing this, this weird stuff going on but who do you call you know um, yeah. they can put it out on their, their Twitter on their social media but they might not have as many followers you know what I mean I mean Adam's got something like a million followers wow you know, you know, I mean I've got a minimum amount I don't have even close to that um, but you know, so he reaches out and and you know tells these people. So he it gives him a much a much louder voice. Um, but there are people who don't have that voice. You know, so the idea of the show is really give those people a platform, um, okay. tell their story, but bring you know. And then I come in and and try to explain what's going on. We we try to capture evidence of what's going on, um, and then we try to fix it. We actually legitimately try to help them. Well, I tell you, that sounds a lot different because, uh, like you say, most of them are getting to where they're kind of cookie cutter, same old, same old. You get a few of right. them that are different. Um, the holes are files. Um, I like the way they <laughs> they do things. It's it's different than what you usually see. 
Yeah, but, for sure, for sure. And uh, you know, there's there's several of them out there. That, but everybody has their own little niche. Right. But that's the thing. Everyone has their own style. Everybody has their own technique. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you you know, you, the way they the way, way they're filmed, and that, there really is only one way to do a paranormal investigation. You know, you've got to find your information. You've got to do your research. You know, you've got to you know have someone show you around the house where they're experiencing stuff, and then you've got an investigation, and then show the, show the person. So I get it. When you're doing a cookie cut show, that's the very simple way to do it. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily the right way or the wrong way. You know, or the only way. Hours, I mean, you know, we ultimately yes, I'm sure <laughs> that if you watch it, so you know, it does sort of follow a very similar because that's how it's done, but. The way that we're approaching it, and the way that we're doing stuff, and the way, you know, the, the I think we do it, um, is more real. I think, you know, is is not. How do I put this? Um, you know, it's there's more of a sort of real time thing going on here. You know, we're in an investigation, and I'm like, okay, we just experienced this, or uh, we just found this, and I'm, I'm and I don't understand it. You know, so what do I do? I reach out. And so during the investigation, I say, look, has anybody experienced something like this? Or has anybody seen this during your investigations? Because, you know, although I don't have a million followers, the followers that I do have on social media are mostly paranormal people. You know, people who have the interest in, in the paranormal, people who um, are part of a ghost. Uh-oh. What happened? I think we lost him. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, Chris, are you still there? Okay, I guess I'm going to hang up and try again. Skype does not like to cooperate with us. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to get this to work as quickly as possible. Pardon the delay. Oh, right. Hey, Kyle, how you doing? All right. For some reason, it decided to uh, cut out on me. Okay. Hence to start running in the wheel. There we are. There we are. You gotta gotta get a new hamster. That's what it is. <laughs> well, everything is hooked up to an exercise bike, so I gotta pedal a little faster. Yeah, if, you're not, if you're not moving, then we got no show. <laughs> my my apologies. No, we had a good conversation. I think we were off air about the concept of the show where having the different uh, social media posts combined with the equipment um, really makes it more of a ghost story where the viewers can follow along and it doesn't seem like something made up because you've got the social media posts with their different timestamps and then everything is investigated. <clears throat> That's the important thing as well. So the other thing to think about here is that, you know, rather than, than just being a journal, Social media is a tool. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like having um, an encyclopedia with you all the time. And, yep. it, you know, and it, you know, when, when you do experience something, when you do have something that you're not sure about, and you put out there, hey, I just did this, or I just experienced this, or has anybody seen what this is? You know, I'm, I'm asking questions, and I'm asking people who may very well be an expert in that field. And that, because, honestly, from, from, from you know, as, as, as a sort of personal uh, opinion, 
I don't think there's any experts in the paranormal. You know, I don't think there are any experts in the paranormal because we're still taking baby steps right now. We still don't really know what's out there. But what we can do, we, can, we have experienced paranormal investigators, you know, people who have been in the field for a long time. And, you know, I can reach out and I can ask various different people different things like, have you ever experienced this or have you ever experienced that? And then I'll get someone back saying, hey, maybe it's this or have you tried doing this way? And it will add to the investigation because it's something I didn't think about. You know, and it's something that we didn't really know about. So it, it sort of changes the direction that maybe we were going in. Um, and so it keeps us on our toes as well because we're trying. And, it's, it, you know, it's, it's like instant answers, you know. So I, I, I love it. I think it's a great new way of doing it. Like, it was, and, and I, like we were saying off air, I always tell people to sort of keep a journal. Um, you know, when they're experiencing weird stuff, um, keep a journal because when you're sitting down writing, writing down what you experience, it puts you in a different mindset. Um, you know, at the time you're like, oh my God, what the hell is going on? But when you sit down and write it out and you look at it and you read it, or even if you come back to it a day or two later, it's like, huh, I wonder if that was actually this, or I wonder if what I was actually experiencing was something else, you know, or maybe it was just the heater or maybe it was, and it, you know, you start to think about things more logically when it's, you know, when you, when you've been able to step away and then come back to it. And I think that's another thing that the, you know, by, by telling our story and for people posting their stories on social media, you know, it, it, it allows for a different perspective. And even if that perspective is your own, so do you go into your cases kind of, let's say, cold, where you don't know everything as far as the uh, experiences? Yeah, well, so Adam and Jen kind of know what's going on um, because they generally have gone into the location before I have. Um, and, you know, I need to know some of it because, obviously, at the same time, I'm my, my goal is to try and build something new for every investigation. And for me just to go in completely cold, um, you know, I don't know, how would I be able to build something in that time? But at the same time, like, um, so Adam Jen go into a location. Um, they then like contact me and say, look, this, this person's experiencing this or this or this. And I'm like, okay guys, what we need to then do is while you guys go do some research, while you go do this or while you go do that, I'm going to come up with some ideas. I'm going to put something together. Um, and then we'll meet back at the house tonight. And so I'll go searching for things. There was one point where um, I, I was driving around um, the, the local town looking for a thrift store. I'm not going to tell you why, <laughs> but um, I was looking for something very specific for one of the investigations. Um, and I think it's the second from last that uh, we actually used this, this particular tool. But um, yeah, ultimately, I, I'm, I'm trying to find something or, or um, build something that helps us with that investigation as well as using obviously the, the, the other stuff that I have. I mean, I have a lot of equipment, you know, I've been building equipment for a while and, and you know, so yeah. <laughs> the questions I had, uh, you mentioned building the equipment, like with the sound detection equipment, do you modify existing equipment to kind of like just uh, search different frequencies that you have an idea of that you want to target or do you just build you know, completely new machines. I'm, I'm a little bit new to it, but it, it's, it's something that I'm curious about. So we do modify cameras. Mm -hmm. um, cameras do get modified. Um, I mean, that started well, about 10 years ago. I started modifying cameras, and that started with a webcam, actually, um, because they're cheap. So I was like, okay, yeah. let's see if I can figure this out. So I took apart a webcam and, you know, figured out how to remove the infrared filter so that I could then put it all back together. And so that now you can see in the dark, you know, with an infrared light. But then I had to build the lights to go with it. And so I did that as well. So now I build infrared lights and I'm doing this camera. And from that, you know, um, it, it took, you know, a little bit of research and, and a lot of trial and error. Um, but we were modifying GoPros and, okay. um, you know, a, a other sort of the GoPro, the GoPro knockoffs, things like that, you know, the, the action cameras. Um, and so we're looking into modifying those as well. Um, you know, so those ones, yes, because we want to be able to see in the dark. Audio stuff, I don't touch my audio recorder. I love my audio recorder. Right. You know, I have an audio recorder. I have the uh, the Zoom H1. I also have a Zoom H2 as well. 
but the H1, I love that recorder. That's my go-to recorder all the time. It's a very it's a simple stereo recorder, and in my opinion, probably the best recorder you can get for under 100 bucks. So, speaking of investigations, do you feel there's any difference between doing investigations here versus what it's like doing it over in the UK? No. No, it's... I mean, certainly not here. I mean, it's still just as cold. Um, but <laughs> honestly, you know, the cool thing about the UK is you get castles. You know? Right. Um, over here, not so much. Um, but, you know, you, you have a lot of history in the UK, you know, a lot of history throughout Europe, you know, and it's, and it's older than 200 years, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I mean, okay, America is, is 200 years old, but it was here still before that, you know, it wasn't like, oh, suddenly there's a country, you know, yeah. so this, this you know, it still has a lot of history. Um, and we're always, I think, with, with America, you're always going to run into the, the sort of the Native Americans. Hey, you're in Ohio. Are you familiar with the uh, Indian burial mound in uh, near Heath, uh, Newark Heath? Like someone you saying uh, older than, uh, you know, the actual country. It's one of the things that they talk about. It's an uh, Indian burial mound. And there's a bunch of them, and they're huge structures. They're, they're, they're uh, shaped like different animals. And uh, when the Indians died, they actually buried them in the mound. You should Google it, Indian burial mounds. There's a lot of stuff in Ohio, um, sure. you know, before, you know, Europeans and, and after that's, like, really, like, interesting as, as far as paranormal and just other stuff goes. Sure. That's the other thing. I didn't really get much of an opportunity to investigate America. Yeah. Uh, you know, not with well, not with the previous show, not with Ghost Hunters International, but you know, in in the whew, the seven years, eight, no, six years that we we hadn't, I, I stopped filming with them. Obviously, I've been to a few places, um, but I haven't managed to to really sort of explore a lot. I mean, I I don't live that far from Waverly Hills, and I still have never been. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, so like. There's still a lot to do out here. Go to Dave, see plenty of crazy people and ghosts, so. <laughs> <laughs> there's, to be fair, there's probably weird shit everywhere, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave is full of crackheads. They're like, they're half alive and half dead anyway. Well, I won't be going there then. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dave's got the living dead. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was Atlanta. Go to Pasadena, Texas. You'll find someone, some there. <laughs> well, well, I was in. I, I, we did two um, two investigations in Texas uh, with Trending Fear. Uh, one was Mineola. Okay. And the other was Tumble. Tumball. Oh yeah, I know Tumball very well. Yeah. So My girlfriend grew up in Tumble, Texas. Really? Yeah. It's a small world. Um, but yeah, we did we did one of, the, one of our investigations is there. Yeah, the thing about Texas, if you watch whenever bad storms are coming through, you find new little towns you never heard of before. <laughs> <laughs> so what's you been... What I, think, I think it was Mineola. But whilst um, we are filming... Um, I was wandering around the town. I just because I like to sort of wander these old towns, and um, behind the, the house we were investigating, I found in in amongst a bunch of shrubbery and trees an old fire truck. Oh wow! Yeah, just an old fire truck in the middle of like nowhere, um, surrounded by trees. I mean, like shrubbery has started growing over it. And then, I mean, I, it must have been there for a very long time, but it was very cool looking. Do you know what the biggest city is close to Mineola? Uh, what, isn't it Austin? No, it's, uh, it's it close to Austin? Or was that Tomball? Tomball is closer to Houston. Oh, it might be Houston I'm thinking of then. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. So no, what? what? I, uh, no, I don't remember. Oh, that's all right. I'll, I'll look it up later because uh, that's one of the few towns I don't think I know. Okay. So what's been your favorite investigation in the States? My favorite in the States? Well, I mean, my favorite from the show uh, would have been the Oregon case, which I think is going to be episode two. Um, that was one of these cases where, like, you think you know what's going on. Um, well, you sort of, you get told, because, again, we, I get a sort of an idea of what we're looking at, 
Mm-hmm. But it's not until I get there when I really, you know, when we start talking to the client and then they tell us their, their stories. So I have an idea, but at the same time, I kind of don't. Um, so I thought, okay, you know what? I know what's going on here. So we I, we arrive, they tell a story, and I'm like, okay, well, actually, that's not what's going on at all. Um, and the whole thing got flipped upside down, you know. It, it got turned on its head, and we were like, okay, now we've got to figure this out. Like, we have no idea. Because, so, you know, the production company comes you know up with the you know they, they have to they come up they you know they have the case we, we you know we put in touch with them someone's reached out to us then the production company contact these people they talk they, you know and so they get an idea of what's going on so they know what's happening even if we don't so they go there with with a, with a concept with an idea and like okay this is what we need to do you know we've only got a week there you mm. know so you know they kind of like okay this is what we've got to do we've got to make sure we do this we do this and we do this However, when we get there, and that's not the situation, when the situation is something completely different, everybody is thrown on the head, and everyone's now got, like, you know, six more days to figure out how we're going to do this, mm-hmm. you know? And so that was, that was one of the, the, the really cool things about this, is, like, they, they come to me, or they'd be like, okay, so what do we do here? How do, how do we do this? What, what do you think we should do about this? Um... You know, because you know they they you know they they they, they come to me. You know, I, I'm you know as a paranormal investigator, like how do we do this? And so this is where it's like, okay, now I've got to figure out how we're going to do the investigation and how we're going to you know. And I, I talk to them, and then you know, how we're going to make this sh- make this into the show? You know, how are we going to make a show? Um, and obviously, you know, the the making of the show is all on them ultimately. But like when it comes to the investigation thing. What are they going to do? So this is I had to sort of game plan with them and like okay, so this is how we go. And and we actually, um, I'll tell you. I mean, I think actually this is this is part of one of the press releases. Um, so I'm not spoiling anything here, but um, ultimately um, it got to the point where we actually had to reach out to um, a voodoo priestess. Oh wow! From Louisiana, we actually flew her in, like there and then. Like we actually like reached out. I said, look, can we can we fly you in and, and can you help us out? And we actually got them within like a day or so's notice. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was. And that experience alone was actually really cool because I've never experienced anything like that. And when you, so I don't know anything about voodoo, you know, but again, that's what we we're talking about before. The power of social media is like, okay, we're, we've got this situation. Who can help? You know? And so that was the cool thing there is that, you know, we managed to find somebody and they were willing to come out straight away. And that was really cool. So and just to be part of that as well, that was cool. So most of your investigations are like, what, a week, two weeks? The, each one is about a week. About a week? Are yeah. You- so we, you know, and so it's sort of crunch. You know, we've got to get in there and figure things out. And we have to go back and review all the stuff that we've caught, all the audio that we've recorded, the video that we've recorded. You know, I was I was busy from day one. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, so, I've also got to build some equipment as well. So I've got to build something for the investigation. We've got to plan the investigation. You know, then I've got to do the investigation and then, you know, review all the, uh, the audio that we've recorded, any footage, like video that we've recorded. I've got to look, look at that. Um, you know, it's... A lot to do in a week. I didn't sleep a lot. <laughs> I can imagine not. But I know that a lot of the shows, they have like interactive shows that come on where they're investigating at Halloween or something like that. Are y'all going to do anything right. like that? Um, do- only, no, well, see, obviously we can't do the live stuff mm-hmm. you know, because, um, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. You know, we've, we've already filmed the episodes, so when they come out, we, you know, but I mean... I will most likely have Twitter up every single time the episode airs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll be able to, to talk to people like that way. Um, so yeah, people want to reach out. I mean, I can't guarantee I'll get to everybody, but I would definitely try. Um, I don't have a life. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, I do try to, to, uh, to, to respond to people. Um, you know, the, the real sort of interactive element of it was during the investigations, you mm-hmm. know, where we did reach out to social media, you know, just because no one knew. And that was the cool thing as well. Like, no one knew we were filming a show. 
you know, just people just assumed I was out on an investigation. So when I had a question, when I put it out there, said, hey, has anybody done this? Or, I wasn't just getting people who have watched the TV show respond. Mm -hmm. I was getting my followers who are, again, they're paranormal people, you know. They're the people who are interested in the, in the ghosts. So whether or not they're actually, you know, paranormal investigators or they just they, they find that subject, that topic interesting, you know, I was able to reach out and say, hey, has anybody ever experienced something like this? And that's where you know, I would get responses. And I thought that, that in itself um, really helped. And there was a few things that, that came back that really did help, actually. I think that was smarter shooting it that way because if people would have known that this was for television, you'd have had so many different types of more... The best way to put it is noise or people just looking for attention that really weren't right, in it right. to actually aid the, the investigation. You had people who were really involved and sincere and yeah. really just wanted to try to get to the bottom of it. Right. And they, yes, <clears throat> exactly. I mean, they, 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 people aren't doing it for fame and fortune, you know. Yeah. We're, just, we're, we're just trying to help people out. And that's the way it should be. Because exactly. too many people, they think you're, you're going to be filming and they're going to be on television and they just make a bunch of stuff up. Yeah, no, we're all millionaires. Mm-hmm. That's another misconception they seem to have. Tell me about it. Because most everybody that I know that are are on television, they make their money off of other stuff. Like, um, I believe uh, Dave Tango, he has like a board game company or something like that. That's uh, Grant Wilson. Is it Grant that does that? I know one of them did. Grant's got the board games. Yeah, Grant's got the board games. Um, uh, ooh, yeah. I mean, I have my own things going on. I do little things, I, I silly things. But honestly, like the conventions and stuff, mm -hmm. that, they they really help. They the help. appearance money. You know what I mean? Well, it's just even just like selling a, a, a photograph. You know what I mean? It's like things like that. You know, the, the taking pictures and, and and signing autographs and things like that. It's silly, but like it really helps with the bills. You know. Go on, and like um, let's see. Um... Oh my gosh, what's his name? Um, well, Samantha Hall, she still teaches school, and I know she's, you know, she was doing that while she was on the show. Uh, yeah. Dustin, Dustin, I think he writes books. Dustin okay. Parry. Yeah, yeah. He has a uh, motivational speeches. Yes. He travels around, does a lot of motivational speeches. Um, you know, it. Yeah, I mean, we all have our our uh, our day jobs. Yeah. You know. But it's cool, too, to be able to have an outlet like, you know, the Discovery Channel or the Travel Channel, and it's not buried on cable access, so the whole world gets to see it, but then it's not so flooded with money that it winds up being like the Grammys or some other, like, pop music or something dumb. So it's it's a happy medium, and, and you know... It, you know, one day soon it could wind up being some fad where you've got people like the Kardashians doing a ghost show. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, we can kind of be able to enjoy it right now that, you know, there's even something that Mike Tyson said, and there's a lot of people who were famous. is like once they got rich and famous, they wish that they could go back to the time right, right before they got famous when it was just for the love of it. Well, I can assure you that, that, that no one in the paranormal field is going to be famous. You know? <laughs> You know, we we're not celebrities. Well, you know what I mean, I I keep keep getting you know called hey the paranormal celebrity. I'm like I'm not. It's reality TV. I just had a job to do. Well, and, and I did my job. We figure in in our circle in the paranormal community, um, y'all are like rock stars. You know, everybody <laughs> strives to be like y'all. No, nobody wants to be like me. God. <laughs> hey, I. You know, I, nobody wants to go backwards. I, I saw your pictures on social media. I know you like to go over them conventions in the Ghostbuster outfits. <laughs> um, yeah, I love dressing up. Um, the wife. Oh my god! I just put a candy in my mouth. Hang on, try. That's okay. <laughs> it's chewier than I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> oh my god! It's got caramel in it. So, um, yeah. So. Um, as well as building ghost hunting equipment, I also build uh, like costumes as well. Mm. Um, yeah, so like I actually built the like the proton packs for both my wife and I. Um, I built like a trap as well and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I build stuff. I uh, build costumes. I have a, a, a like a full predator costume. Uh, 
I have the Ghostbusters on, and we do. Actually, really cool because a buddy of mine also like we persuade. I have a friend who like um, his name's Rob, and he has like horrible anxiety. Like he hates. He, he it's very difficult. He, he'd rather live in his little box, and um, I put him into horrible situations. I do. I put him into these awkward situations um, to sort of. Well, it helps him. I mean, it's actually he, over the last few years he's gotten a lot better, and now. And uh, one of the things that we did is I got him because he's just like me. I mean, we, we love the Ghostbusters as well, so he has a Ghostbusters jumpsuit as well. Um, and we did a we went to the Ren Festival. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, you know, it's weird. Okay, you don't think okay? Why would the Ghostbusters be a Ren Festival? But um, it was actually really, really good. It was really fun. I mean, it was one of those like I think it was like a time travelers weekend or something. So any you can dress up as whatever. But um, the the response we got from adults and children was just amazing. And like as a, as a little group, people wanted pictures and that. And for for him, he completely like forgot his, about his anxiety. You know, once you see a couple of kids' faces, mm-hmm. and like much, you know, it's 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 great. And obviously, that was me. That was that, that little kid smiling at the Ghostbusters. That was me when I was five years old. You know. So it brings me joy, but it brings them joy as well, you know. And Some people tell well. his friends, it's like, I saw the Ghostbusters today and show pictures. Right, right. and they got the pictures because everyone yeah, it's has like, a- no, the real Ghostbusters. <laughs> 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 you know, they, they have no idea I was, I was ever on a TV show. They have no idea that I'm a paranormal investigator. They don't care. I'm a Ghostbuster, you know, and I got you my are, wife next to me, and you know, you got like one of one proton packs. You got like actual proton packs that you made. I mean, it's like you actually do paranormal investigations. You you modify cameras. I mean, you're the closest thing to actually a legit Ghostbuster there is. I mean, you got to give yourself some kind of credit. I'm pretty close. Yeah, yeah. you you yeah. guess. Think about all the places on Earth that you said that you've actually investigated. Oh. And whether it was a penny or a pound, you actually got paid to do that. Someone paid you money to go to the South Pacific to be like, are there ghosts here? Oh, yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, see, and the funny thing is, growing up, like, so obviously, one, obviously, I didn't want to be a ghostbuster. But two, I even wanted to be James Bond or Indiana Jones. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, like, that was the epitome of a who, that's a real man's man, you know? Yeah. And um, there was an investigation I did out in Belize. Um where, honestly, like, that's as close as anybody's ever going to get to being Indiana Jones. You know, it was like, I had to swim into a cave. I had to um, get, walk through a waterfall. We had to climb through rocks. Um, we were in, like, uh, what they, it was the Mayan underworld. You know, I had to climb up a rock and jump onto a ledge um, and then go into, like, this cathedral area, which they only just discovered, like, this whole area is, is relatively newly discovered. They had pottery from the Myers, you know, they had that, uh, at the very end, um, there was this, uh, this fossilized remains of a Maya princess. Oh, wow. And what happened to the bone is like quartz crystal had grown over the bone. So that the whole thing was crystallized. Right. Sweet. So it was this, yeah, it was this crystal. It was actually the episode, it was Ghost Hunters International. The episode was called Crystal Maiden. Um, and that, there, with the exception of a giant rock chasing me out of that cave, I was Indiana yeah. Jones. That was, that, was, that was my Indiana Jones moment. I always wanted to be Han Solo. Yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> but see, I'm a, big, I'm a big nerd. I still like going to the comic book conventions and stuff. And I, got, oh, I love that. I actually got to dress up. Uh, uh, um, the Nuka-Cola clock, that's from uh, Fallout, the game Fallout. Yeah, I see. You got a face licker, uh, alien face licker. Is that yeah, like a, a face licker? Yeah. Um, I've got, if you look above my head, actually, I have Toy Story up there. I've got yeah, I see him. Woody and Jesse and, you know, I'm just a big kid, really. But I have bigger toys now. Like, as a kid, I had a little, little vacuum cleaner on my back, pretending I was a Ghostbuster. <laughs> now I have a full-size proton pack hanging on the wall, you know. <laughs> well, the last time I dressed up, I was Spider-Noir. Um, Spider Noir, okay. Yeah, if you ever watched uh, the yeah, Spider Verse. Yeah. yeah. That that's always a blast, especially when you got people left and right saying, "Hey, can I take a picture with you?" Yeah. There was a little kid there dressed as Spider Ham, so we everybody's like, oh, "Can my- y'all take a picture together?" <laughs> Peter Porker. Peter Porker. 
It's funny though, it's like um as my kids are getting older and my oldest is uh twenty five and my I got twenty five, twenty three and twenty one. And kids that age, like they're really into cosplay. They're into like the comic book character, the actual, you know, the real details, not just the movies. But they don't consume movies and media like we used to. Like they'll watch a YouTube show and just binge watch YouTube or everything is Netflix. So that the type of content that you're producing, it's it's not getting the the the, the crowd that's being measured by Nielsen. But I think you're getting a lot more eyes and a lot more attention than you're realizing. And it's kind of shaping the future of how entertainment is made, really. Because in, in five to ten years, it's like even now, it's like no one talks about... People don't even know what's on net, uh, on network TV anymore. Right. Like, it could be everyone knew what the NBC Thursday night lineup was at 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And no one has the clue, but everyone knows what's on Hulu and Netflix now. Mm-hmm. Well, see, that's the thing, though, is like... You know, it, it, I think that's the other sort of the other angle that we were trying for here is that we're we're aiming for like sort of the millennials. Yeah, you know, this isn't just. I mean, I was the oldest one. You know, I, I'm I'm I just turned forty. Um, Adam and Jen, they're in their like early twenties, mid twenties. Mm. You know, they are they they are millennials. You know, um, and that's the sort of target I think that we're going for, which is the reason another reason why we're utilizing. You know today's social media, the the the, the, the platform, uh, the the crowdfunding, the crowd uh, crowd source, crowd, oh my god, crowd sourcing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know we're, we're we're out there utilizing where everybody else is. You know, and I think uh, that's another thing. You know, it's not the same old thing that you know we've done a hundred times. You know, right. Well, you know, so, social media when we were kids was a little note that says, "Do you like me? Check yes or no." <laughs> yeah, it comes back with a third swear. And don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, or it's the uh, who is this? Um, but yeah. Right. And you're right. It was like a screwed up piece of paper and threw it or something. Um, yeah, I mean it's. Amazing how quickly you know, technology has really advanced. I mean, look at, I mean, even when I first started Ghost Hunting, which, you know, bear in mind, I had the whole the whole uh, interest in it, and that, but I didn't actually get out into a ghost hunt until I was in Tucson. So we're talking maybe 13, 12, 13 years ago. Mm. There was no equipment out there for ghost hunting. Like, it, the, the, you know, it was, uh, we were repurposing equipment that was already there, like the cameras mm-hmm. and um, EMF meters. And it was all very sort of basic stuff. It was all very simple stuff. There was there was only like a Sony camcorder was pretty much the only night vision camera you could get. Um, and even that would only see about seven to 10 feet. And that's one of the other reasons why I started building equipment is because we needed it. You know, there was nowhere else to get it. I couldn't just go online and buy an infrared extender. Mm-hmm. And now, I could type in infrared lights and all sorts of stuff comes up. But back then, it didn't. Or if it did, it was for like commercial uses and it was several hundred dollars. I could yeah. build one of these things for like 30, 40 bucks. And so I was saving money by doing that. But what I was ultimately doing there is, is you know, being one of the first people to actually build equipment specifically for ghost hunters. Um, and after that, it just, I mean, you, now you can find any Tom Dick and Harry's out there trying to sell their stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but we went through a whole phase of people just building shit. They were building stuff that didn't work. They were building stuff just to try and, and make it make a couple of dollars, um, and basically ripping people off. Um, one of the things that I was, um, you know, one of the things I was trying to do is, is genuinely help people. Um, and there was a small group of us who were, who were like-minded, um, building equipment, and you know trying to get it out there into the field and you know that's you know where where we are now i mean you know you can go to you can go online go to ghoststop.com and you can buy paranormal equipment yeah that's usually where i get my stuff from yeah that's where i like all the, anything that i have invented anything that i have come up with you can generally you can find it there well, we live in such a great age now that we have this equipment we can go to, where yeah. the old days it was, you know, a tape recorder and a camera. Yes. Yep. Now there's all sorts of stuff. We're shooting lasers out there. 
we, we, you know, there's people who are experimenting with smoke machines. There's people out there, and I love the whole idea of experimentation. Oh yeah, experiment, but know what's evidence yeah. and what's you know just uh, part of your experiment. You can't experiment with something, and then first time you capture something weird, you're like, oh cool, it's a ghost. That's not yeah. experimenting. That's you know you just assume you got that. Five, a ghost sheet, uh, uh, smoke machines, eighteen laser lights, and all <laughs> types of this other stuff clouding it up, and your yeah. dog farts and it lights up blue, and it's like, yeah, I got a ghost. It's like you got a flatulent pool. <laughs> it's like that's um, that thing with the Xbox. Uh, the SLS. You know, yeah, the SLS thing. Like. I think there's probably some merit to that, but yeah. I think it requires a lot more experimentation. And, you know, you've got to... I think that the biggest problem is people don't know what they're using. You know, they see something on TV, or they see somebody else using something, and then they go out and buy it, and they, they basically understand, you know, point it in this direction, and you'll get stuff. But what about what they're actually seeing? You know, is it a case of... You know, they're misunderstanding it. Is it a case of they don't really know what it is? You know, are they just jumping to conclusions? And for the most part, you know, know your equipment. And that's even to, down to the basics. That's, that's your audio recorders and your cameras. When you're taking a photograph, know your camera. You know, does it have software that will bring eyes and nose and mouth out? There's, there's photo rec sorry, facial recognition software built into, into, into phones, sorry, into, into cameras that will enhance the eyes, nose, mouth. It will focus in on that and bring it forward. Now, if you're taking a picture of a tree or uh, some bushes and the camera thinks it sees an eyes, nose, and mouth, it will bring that out. So then when you're looking at your photographs, you're like, wow, cool, there's a face. But why the hell would there be a face in a tree? Yeah. What are you trying to say? That someone died and then the tree grew out of them and they became a tree? Think about it. Think about what you're saying. You know, you can look at the sky and see a cloud that looks like a rabbit. Mm -hmm. like, Damn well, that's not a rabbit in the sky. Or right. like a piece of toast that has Jesus or the Virgin Mary on it. Yeah. And well, then the grilled cheese. It's a grilled cheese with the Virgin Mary. That's, that, that's the only one that's legit. <laughs> Well, I know the way we approach investigations is to go in as a skeptic and, you know, try to debunk everything that you've come across. And if everybody's in agreement, well, then maybe you can put that out there like, hey, what do you think? Other, yeah. other than that, I won't put it on social media. Right. Right. Well, this is a I mean, I'm, I, I, I do try to figure out what's going on. I try to eliminate the obvious, first of all. You know, and once you've eliminated the obvious, once you've, in, you know, you have uh, eliminated um, anything environmental, um, anything that, 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 you know, you can explain, that's the only time you're left with something potentially paranormal. Mm -hmm. And that's when I reach out. This is when I, I go, okay, Look, I think I've eliminated everything. I think, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know what's going on. Does anybody else know what this could be? Then that's when you're left with something potentially paranormal. You have to explore all avenues. And the cool thing is that we've now got an avenue, social media, which lets us get the knowledge from a lot of people. Well, another problem is, is even when you put it out on social media, if you're telling the people, this is what I see, then that's what they want to see. Exactly. That's why I never tell anybody. I, like, if you listen to an audio piece, my thing is, what do you hear? Not what do I, this is what I hear. You know, I, I, you, you know, you're, you're in, you're, you're basically contaminating it by introducing that. It's that whole, you know, if you run a Black Sabbath uh, disc backwards, uh, uh, a record backwards, suddenly you hear him summoning the, de the devil or something. It's all BS. That's no. It's 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 matrixing. It's parody. You know what I mean? You're just your brain is wired to make sense of nonsense. Exactly. Like when you're looking at a picture, you know that yep. you think, oh wow, this is a face. Well, you know, there's lots of factors in why it looks like a face because your mind wants to find that. Yeah, looking for. Yeah, but that's the thing. We're wired. We were hunters once upon a time when we were cavemen. That's what we looked for. We were looking for meat, we were looking for animals, and every single creature has an eyes, nose, and mouth. We are programmed to look for eyes, nose, and mouth. 
because that's what we, you know, that's, we, like I said, we were hunters. And even now, that's what we do. So we look at something, and the first things we see is, oh, it looks like a face. Right. Uh, you look at advertising with cartoon characters and logos, and they stick eyes, nose, and mouth on everything to get us to look at it. You're right. You're right. That's what we noticed first. Wow. That's what we noticed first. There was a photograph, actually. There was a photograph that was um, put out a little while back. I think it was actually a, a dentist um, was advertising. And what they did is they had a, 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 this, uh, there was a guy and a, and, a, and a woman, and he's smiling, and you notice his tooth is missing. But no one noticed the fact he didn't have any eyebrows. <laughs> because we were looking at eyes, nose, and mouth. Yeah. You know, we weren't looking at the eyebrows. We looking, So everyone's noticing this, this missing tooth. No one even noticed the guy didn't have eyebrows. That's crazy. So that's, that's the way we're programmed. So one of the things about our show is we have an interactive chat room when the show's going on. Sure. And... <laughs> Our buddy Darren, of course, has thrown some questions out there, and I'd like to get to them if I could. Uh, one thing he wants to know is, do you think that uh, when you're asking questions, do you think that ghosts ask questions of you as well? Sometimes, um, and hopefully we get them. Um, so, you know, there's there's various different techno tools that we use, um, as well as, um, so there's our audio recorders, but I also had a tool called the RTEDP, which is real-time EDP recorder. Um, now, on the basis of the technology, um, on, the, on the theory that um, spirits will actually imprint their voice on the audio, so you don't necessarily hear it. That, that would be a, that would be a disembodied voice. Mm -hmm. EDP is when you hear a voice, but you didn't hear it during the investigation. So what the RTEDP does is it actually um, records and then plays it back like five seconds later. So you're actually hearing the recording. There's a buffer in there, you know? So if I sat in a room and I had my headphones on and I said, look, is anybody in here? Five seconds later, I'll hear my own voice asking if anyone's in here. And then there's the potential for that response. That way, if someone says something, I will hear it and I'll be able to respond to that. And that was, that was, that was called the RTEVP. Um, that's a great tool. Um, and I think that one there is something which isn't utilized enough. Okay. I don't even know if it's available anymore. I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know. Um, cause I don't know. Uh, that, that was one of Gary Galka's, um, inventions. Um, he's, he's the guy who actually came up with the Mel meter. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I, back in my ghost hunters days, um, he and I used to collaborate on a lot of things and there was like, you know, modifications made to Mel meters you know, that I would ask for, or, you know, there was, there was one time when, um, all the millimeters had this bright green screen mm -hmm. and I came back from one of my investigations and I was talking to Gary saying, look, is there any way we can make this red? Um, it's, it's too bright for the cameras to see. Even on a night vision camera, when you're looking at the screen, you can't see it because the green just, just, just blows it out. Oh. So yeah. And ultimately, if you look now, they're all red, you know, millimeters all have red screens. Um, you know, and so, you know, it's, it, that was the thing we, we would, we would go out there and we would, um, you know, uh, collaborate and there's a handful of people, as I was saying, there's a handful of people who generally make ghost hunting equipment. Um, and we, we talk, you know, there, you know, there's only, there's only a few of us that I know of, um, you know, and one of the others being Sean Porter, who, who, um, who's the guy who owns Ghost Star. Um, he and I have come up with all sorts of ideas. And we used to play uh, Call of Duty, and uh, we we wear our headsets. And while we're playing Call of Duty, we're basically having like conference calls. You know, we were doing now we we're having our business meetings whilst shooting each other. Um, and I tell you, it's, it's productive, man. It was it was super productive because while we're playing, I'm like, so I had this idea. What if you know? And, and then he'd be like, "Well, you know, we got to do this." And, then, and then, ah, I got you, you bastard. And then you know, and then we kept on talking. You know, um, or like he'd snipe me from somewhere. I'd be like, "What the hell?" Um, but yeah, so you know that that was awesome. And, and the other, you know, the thing with that is like we'd have other people join us as well um, because we sucked. We we actually we sucked at the Call of Duty. So we'd play in our own room. We'd actually do like a private room, um, and we would just fight each other that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the cool things with Sean. Actually, we, we threw a lot of ideas out there, and that, and that's when we came up with Boo Buddy. You know. Um, 
we wanted to create a trigger object uh, that was you know, that was a bear. Um, and uh, initially, it was like we just need to make like an EMF bear, um, sort of as a sort of uh, a starting point. And uh, I remember like one, I think my daughter was going through a like a Toys R Us catalog or something, and I saw something that looked like Teddy Ruxpin. It might have been Teddy Ruxpin, but it might just look like Teddy Ruxpin. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh man, what if I can make the bear talk? So I texted Sean, I was like, dude, so obviously I can make this bear an EMF bear, but what if I can make it ask EVP questions as well? And he says, like, do it. If you can do it, do it. So I did some research on that. And so the first version of, of uh, the Boo Buddy was um, an EMF detector and you press a button and it would ask three EVP questions. It would have like a space of 30 seconds between them and it would just ask these three questions. Um, and then ultimately, it, it, dude, it, I don't know if, you, if you've not heard of Boo Buddy. I have. Rock, but, um, but yeah, look it up. It's the shit. Because from that version, we um, we actually got in touch with uh, this, this an electrical engineer. And we said, look, this is what we need. We need something that's going to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And he looked at us very funny because, you know, he'd obviously never built anything for ghost hunting before. Um, but he came back with a prototype and we played with it and I thought, well, we need to change this and we need to make it do this. And, that do. and after about two years of back and forth, we actually had a final model where we actually had a circuit board made up um, and you know, we, we basically, we actually 3D printed all the housing for the, for the circuit boards and the speakers and things like that. Um, you know, so it was all done in house. Um, and then we, we actually, you know, introduced Boo Buddy to the world. They're through Ghost Stop, and you can only get them through Ghost Stop. And I, right now, I think they, they, it's been, you know, say he's been on vacation um, because there's been some parts we've been trying to get. But, um, I believe it's coming back soon, um, and ultimately, um, what it does now is when you when you turn turn Boo Buddy on, um, it first line it, it baselines the it's 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 environment. Mm -hmm. So it baselines the um, current EMF. It measures uh, the current temperature in the room. It measures its own orientation. Okay. Then after the, after thirty seconds, um, it then says, "Hi, I'm Boo Buddy. What's your name?" And then it will wait 40 seconds. Um, and now if there's no change to the environment, if there's been no change to the, to the temperature or anything like that, they'll ask another EVP question. And it will wait another 40 seconds. Now, it will continue to ask EVP questions throughout. But if something changes, like say, I don't know, the temperature raises in the room or around the, the bear, um, it will say, did you make it warm in here? So it continues asking EVP questions, but what it's also doing is it's giving us a verbal indication that the temperature has changed. Or it'll say, oh, Boo Buddy's cold, telling us the temperature dropped. Um, and then obviously the pores will light up based on the strength of an EMF signal. So one will light up or two will light up means it's, something's getting closer. Um, if Boo Buddy uh, gets knocked over or it senses motion, like um, vibration, um, it will say, um, Boo Buddy is ticklish or um, I like holding hands with you and things like that um, so it gives us again a verbal indication that it was moved or it, it felt motion um, and again if it doesn't you know, there's nothing changes after that those 40 seconds they'll ask another EVP question it has a vocabulary of about 40 phrases oh, wow. it, will just, it will do the investigation for you um, and the cool thing there is as well, like, so we, we did this, we actually invented this about six years ago. Um, and then the voice of Boo Buddy was actually my daughter. So it was my daughter from when she was six years old. Um, and that was cool. I mean, we, we, so I lived in Arizona, as I told you, and, um, you know, we had the AC running constantly and we needed to record these, these sound bites, these, you know, these BVVP questions. So we had to go into the bedroom and put the duvet, the, the, the comforter over our heads to sort of act as a sort of soundproof room. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would sit there and we were like, okay, so let's say, um, you know, say, hi, I'm Boo Buddy. What's your name? And so she would say it and we'd have to say it three times and then she'd start laughing. And, you know, it took a long time to do it. But yeah, um, you know, so 
but ultimately, yeah, she's the uh, she's the voice of Boo Buddy. That's too cool. Now, now we know the secret. Yeah, man, it's it's cool. And, and like, as I say, Boo Buddy, no one has invented anything like that for the paranormal field. Um, like I say, we did that six years ago, and there's still nothing like that on the market. Yeah, that's on our list. Is one of those Boo Bears. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be out soon. I I have on good authority that um, we'll be seeing them again very soon. So Darren has another question for you. Sure, sure. He wants did to. I answer the first one. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Why, yeah, why, you why? did. <laughs> oh, I'm, I I don't know. I'm very. Uh, I don't know. I, I rabbit trail. My brain is like chasing rabbits. I don't know if you ever tried that. So. That squirrel. Yeah, same sort of, Yeah. Right? <laughs> Well, anyways, second question is, is what are your views on doppelgangers and mimic spirits? Well, apparently I look like James Corden. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so doppelgangers, yeah, I'm all for those, I guess. Um, and, and so, sorry, is doppelgangers and what? Mimic spirits. I don't know. I've never experienced it. I've never met anybody who has experienced it. Um, I mean, I think we probably all have a double somewhere. You know, um, I mean, have you seen those pictures of uh, like Keanu Reeves that were actually like from the 1500s or something? You know, there's there's pictures of people who look like other people, but I don't think there's anything. I don't honestly, I've never to say I don't think there's anything is, is probably the wrong thing to say. It's like me saying, oh yeah, we're the only life in, in the universe. Um, you know, that would be somewhat arrogant. Um, but I've never experienced it, so I don't really have an opinion on it. You know. Um, until I've really experienced something, it's tough for me to have an opinion, if that makes sense. Well, it's rough on me because I get compared to Brad Pitt all the time, so, you know. That was supposed be. to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you, so your show comes out this Friday. Yeah. You're excited? Very much so. Um, yeah. I mean, I've been talking about this for over a year now. I mean, the first time they, they, uh, the production company hit me up was November last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and asked me if I would be interested in something like this. And, and I've had other shows hit me up and have other production companies pitch ideas and that. And I, you know, I thought a couple of them were pretty cool. But for the most part, I turned a lot of them down. And um, this one... Actually, I was like, you know what? Like, the concept was to generally help people, mm -hmm. and it was their trend, you know. And I was like, uh, and then when they told me the other ideas that they had, I was like, you know what? This actually, this sounds like it could help. You know, this actually sounds like it, it, this could be a good thing. Um, so yeah, I signed up. I was I was actually excited for this project, and um, it wasn't though until July, I think July of this year, that we actually went out and started filming. So, I mean, it's, it's a slow process, for sure. And I was sort of eager to get going and things like that. Like, as soon as I signed up, I'm like, yeah, I've signed, I want to do this. Let's go out and do it. But there's such, such a process to this that, um, yeah, I almost have forgot that I'd even signed up for it at one point. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know some of those things can take almost two years before they get off the ground. Oh, well, yeah. Well, the thing is, in November when I was talking to them, it had already been bought. Travel mm -hmm. Channel had already signed up for it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just they didn't, like, I think they just wanted to take a different angle, which is why they needed me in there as well. Um, so, yeah, the show was already, like, greenlit. So even even though it was greenlit in November, or even prior to that, even though it had the green light, it still didn't really anything happen for another six months. Yeah, so, it, yeah they, they take a while. Yeah, believe me, I know. Did you remember to turn your microphone off when you went to the bathroom? Uh, yeah, well, you know what, actually, I would always, so I learned that lesson when I was from the first show. Um, so I would always indicate to my audio guy, you know, hey, I'm just hitting the, you know, hitting the jump. And he was like, yep, you turn it off. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they, to be fair, they don't want to hear that anyway. So, you know, if they, if they even suspect you're heading there, the last thing they need is, is your you farting in one ear. Um, so, yeah. No, no, no one wants to hear that. Well, believe it or not, our hour has already 
come and gone. So um, oh. with the show coming on, I'm pretty sure people are going to want to reach out to you. So how do we find you on social media? Easiest thing, uh, both Twitter and Instagram, uh, it's Ghost Guy Paul. G H O S T G U Y P A U L. It took Ghost took Guy Paul. It took me a little bit before I found you, but I did. Ghost Guy Paul. So Guy. let's make it easier on them. And yeah. um, Chris, what do you got coming up? Um, I got a, a cool weekend. Um, there's an award show. I got nominated for two local comedy awards, uh, Hardest to Follow and uh, Most Improved. It's an award show called The Donnie's coming up uh, this Saturday, the 21st, at the Palace Theater in Chattanooga. So if anybody's listening and you're already on my uh, comedian page or my uh, Facebook page, go ahead and vote for me. And then I got the uh, Roast of Santa coming up Sunday. Uh, I'm going to play the uh, head of the Elf Union. That's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I got some other uh, stuff coming. I just got off the uh, the um, shows with Donnie Baker. I got uh, a promoter that's been working with me. He's got some good stuff coming up in March that I want to keep my fingers crossed for. But those are going to be some fun shows. And then uh, I got uh, still got the 29th at the Hyenas in uh, Fort Worth. Well, all I know is I'm ready for you to get here to Austin, man. I know. I got, like, I, like uh, Jamie says, if I don't hurry up and get to Texas, I'm going to be doing the uh, paranormal show from the other side. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever get out this way, Paul, please hit us up. We'll be glad to show you around. Sure. sure so sure. we live just north of Austin. I think, um, I think the production company is based out of Austin. Are they? Yeah, Texas Crew. They're the, Texas Crew is who um, actually produced the show. So, yeah, if you look up Texas Crew Productions, they're in, they're in Austin. As many people that's been on the show that have been in the Ohio area, I'm beginning to think I need to move to Ohio in order to get anything to go. I don't think so because I think <laughs> uh, statistically um, uh, uh, a large percentage of astronauts have come from Ohio. Yeah, astronauts so, and serial killers come from Ohio. Yeah, so for the most part, people leave the planet to get away. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's the birthplace of aviation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, and by the way, Mineola is between Dallas and Tyler. Oh, oh. Yeah. that's right. I think we, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's a thing, I think. I remember Tyler. Yeah. That was the thing. They were kind of cool. They were little little towns. Very cool. A lot of history here in Texas. Oh, there is. Yeah. Oh, boy. Thank you for joining us on Into the Pit. Please follow us on Facebook at the Vibes Broadcast Network and Instagram at the Vibes Broadcast.